today's public service announcement is related to student IDs. You have to get a new student ID apparently, especially if you want to use certain, certain services on campus. I'm not sure about the library. I'll probably find out tomorrow when I'm hiding there. Um, upstairs, the computer lab, um, they've got a new swipey system. If you want to use the open lab upstairs, that fishbowl upstairs, you got to have a new ID. I don't know when they're like being evil and turning you away regarding that, um, but they wanted me to let you guys know. So. You do need it for the library? Okay, so you, that's a confirmation right there. So the other thing is I'm going to do a public service announcement until I run out of public service announcements. Only one a day. And if you are a student and you have a public service announcement that you think would benefit your other students, you're welcome to share it with the class during this time, or you can tell me and I will share it with the class. There are some things that they want us to actually even share in Canvas, like I told you guys already about single stop, right? Um, I'm, I think I'm going to start like a wiki page like this one but it's available to you guys that says need help and then it lists all the help stuff and links and all that good stuff. So um, I'm, I don't think I can make those available for you guys to add stuff. Um, so I will do that too. Please don't plaster a whole bunch of stuff, but I have control. I can delete it too. So. <laughs> I have the power at my disposal. So the other thing related to polling points, I don't know if I had said to you guys in this class, right? The good news is my two classes are in different rooms, so I have like this visual difference, but then it still starts to blur at some point. So did I tell you guys that I, I figured out I could make these pollings into practice quizzes in Canvas? Okay, so when you're absent, you could still do it and get points, right? Um, so, but then I have to check and make sure. <laughs> but I'm going to do it. So that's one of my thing on the list of things to do is already put the two that we've done. So those of you guys, even that were here, could practice, right? Because sometimes you, you got them wrong, and now you need to go back and study, and, and you want that gratification of clicking the correct answer, right? We all like that. So that's, that's on my list of things to do. So um, back to lecture. We left off last time. I forgot to open it. And I'll also be posting tomorrow the new set of objectives and the new PowerPoint because we should get through the rest of this one today, no problem. Which, why don't I just go to the slide we're on first? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, so let's, let's back up for a second, I think. Back up. So the objective is discuss and describe the historical concept of spontaneous generation. So that's what we're going to do in class today, but of course you'll have to identify or distinguish right, some of these things, these experiments, to just prove this idea that stuff basically just went poof, right? But Oh yeah, it's still a bottle. It's not a baby or anything else. It's still a bottle of spray cleaning the boards. Right? It doesn't turn into living matter. Um, so we're going to step through, remember these num these dates, numbers, dates, <laughs> are just there as a frame of reference, right? We're going to go in order, <laughs> right? From the beginning to the somewhat end of the story. And so, and of course, it's all focused around this, now we know, false belief that living organisms can develop from non-living matter or decomposing matter. So something that was once living but is in fact dead. So I think we started to kind of touch on this one, we didn't go into the details of it. So Francisco Reedy, or Reddy, um, did a very sim you know, very simple experiment. <laughs> he took meat, right, uh, and put it in jars and left it exposed to flies. Um, the flies, of course, laid their eggs directly on the meat, the food source, for their eggs, for when their eggs hatched into what? larvae, which we know as maggots, right? And so that way her babies had something to eat right there, right? That's why she put it on the meat, right? And then those um, maggots would develop into the adult flies that you see. Most people without, you know, good keen eyesight or good observation skills um, in that time really didn't notice the eggs, right? 
where he did. He's like, it's the flies, right? This is, it's coming from something living, right? It isn't coming from this dead meat that's decaying. So to help illustrate this to others, he set up um, some jars that were tightly closed. So the flies could not get to the food. They couldn't lay their eggs. No maggots developed. Now, of course, some people started to argue, would, would have just argued, but he went one step further. He actually put gauze, almost like cheesecloth that you might use nowadays, or gauze, right? So there's holes in it, but tiny holes. And the flies could not get to the meat, but they could smell the meat. Are we locked? Can you let them in? So, oh, okay. They were afraid because we already started. All right, okay. Can you peek out? This is just going to annoy me anyways if they're pacing back and forth by the door. Just tell them to come in. Nope. Oh, he's amazing. How far away? Which microbiology? Are you looking for Peterson? Um, no, it's just this general bio one. Bio one. I'm sorry. Which, and there's a sign out here. I didn't see it until I got back off the so Okay, <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Hence the feet I saw going back. <laughs> <laughs> but it, they weren't leaving. <laughs> it's distracting. Okay, so back to the meat. So they could smell it. They knew it was nearby, right? So they laid their eggs right on the mesh. And then right on the mesh, the maggots developed, right? And so he was able to very easily demonstrate to people that meat does not turn into maggots, right? But this was for, I mean, honestly, with a keen eye, you can actually see the eggs. They're not really big time microscopic, especially when there's a large number of them. Um, so, I mean, this was relatively easy for people to believe at the time. So they're like, oh, okay, fine. But when we get to microorganisms, right, this became a little bit more difficult because then we're again dealing with something we can't what? You can't see it. You can't see microorganisms unless they're growing in large numbers, right? So I'll give you guys a real world example of this. Container of orange juice gets pushed all, or apple juice is the best one back of your refrigerator you forget about it right it's hidden back there then you're cleaning out the fridge and all of a sudden you take this this container of apple juice out and it's no longer translucent like it usually is right it's cloudy it might even be chunky and you're like oh yeah trash in this baby right why doesn't look normal there's potentially a large number and i'm pretty sure it's a large number of microorganisms that just grew in that because that's food right Apple juice is food. We're not the only ones who like to consume it. <laughs> right, and it'll ferment, right? Some microorganisms that will fall into that, and notice I said fall into it, right? So apple juice, when you go to the store, right, where do you buy it? In the refrigerator section, the freezer section? Well, you could get it in the freezer section. But, but usually right off the shelf, right? But that's because it's what? It's pasteurized for one, which reduces the number of microorganisms that are present when it was processed, right? So hopefully nothing's growing in it, and it's sealed, right? It's sealed. What do they tell you once you open it to do with it? Refrigerate it. Why do we refrigerate our foods? Microorganisms don't grow as fast, right, to slow down their growth. Now, of course, that's most of the ones we worry about don't grow in the refrigerator fast. Listeria is an example of an exception to that. He actually prefers the refrigerator. It will grow really fast in the refrigerator. So, but for the most part, right, we're going we're gonna to slow growth. We're not going to stop it, right, which means, you know, it gets stuck in the back of the fridge. It's, you know, yeah, it's going to keep growing <laughs> slowly, but it's going to get there eventually, especially when it's been there a while. So we recognize these things, right? And then if you have a person like you, I'm, you have sometimes in your house who will actually take the whole gallon of milk or orange juice or half gallon or something like that and actually bring it to their mouth and drink from it, right? That's when it becomes theirs in my house and their name gets put on it, right? Because I'm not sharing it with you, right? You just contaminated it, did you not? 
But every time you open it, guess what? Micro. Microorganisms falling into it. Pretty neat, too. And that's why they can only stay there for so long, right? Depends on how much gets in, right? Under what conditions, eventually it could potentially go bad. And like she said, it goes sour. Well, some microorganisms, when they ferment sugars, they produce acids. Acids are sour to us, right? So that's why it tastes sour. Or it even can be like cider or even like hard cider, right? And alcohol could actually even be present, right? Because some of them, some organisms, when they ferment sugars, produce alcohol, which, you know, some of us sometimes kind of like that. Um, but, <laughs> you know, there could be other things in there we don't like so much. So it makes sense for this first experiment that John did. He took some type of food source, right? If it's a liquid food in the lab, we call it a broth, right? So he took some liquid food source and he boiled it. He heated it up. He allowed it to cool, but he left the flask open. So no big surprise to us that he ended up with microbial growth, right? But, of course, he was saying by heating it, what was he doing to anything that was living in there? He killed it, right? So it's like, I killed it all. Right? All I have is non-living stuff, so this non-living stuff grew. Well, we all now know, go, well, duh, where did the microorganism come from that grew in there? From the air. From the air. So another one, Lazaro, Lazaro, I love these names. Yeah, like forget about the last one. It would take me all day. Okay, so... This lovely gentleman took it one step further, right? He boiled it, but then he sealed it. And as long as it was sealed, no growth occurred. But when he opened it, growth occurred. Well, of course, some people are like, well, of course. Why didn't it grow when it was capped? What did the organisms not have or the non-living not have to become living matter? Because it was uh, oxygen. Right? Some organisms like ourselves, you seal us up in a confined compartment with no oxygen, we're going to die too. Right? So other opponents to this were like, Psh, that's why it didn't grow. It had no oxygen. The minute you let the oxygen in, of course, you know, now it can become living now. See these problems that we run into? So Louis, of course, the brilliant mind he was, when the time machine is developed, I'm going back. I'm going to go have a glass of wine with him. He's first on my list because his list is long of all the cool stuff he thought of. So I would like to chat with him. So his first experiment he did, he filtered air through cotton. Why do you think he did that? What was he trying to prove? There's stuff in the air. There's stuff in the air. So he was trying to trap it in the cotton. And he succeeded when he placed that into sterile broth, right? Broth that didn't have anything living in it, he observed growth. But he didn't just stop there. Like, he kept going, <laughs> right? But, you know, this is like definitely, okay, there's something in the air, right? What if I can keep that something in the air out, but still allow air in? Could I still stop growth? And so they're not as pretty as drawn in some of the drawings you will see. They're actually kind of crooked swan necks. But the whole point is that he took the neck of these flasks and he stretched it out and curved it such that air had to enter indirectly, right? So stuff usually falls out of the air into stuff, right? Unless you've got a fan blowing or something like that, it's not going to blow, right, all the way through this curved neck. So he took stuff, he boiled it, so again he's got food, he should have killed all the microorganisms by boiling it, he gets no growth. I mean literally left stuff on his shelves for years. No growth. Okay? But again some people are saying, oh well, it's because it can't grow. What you have can't grow. Or, or any number of reasons, right? Just to prove that it still could actually grow, sometimes he broke the flask so that the air would contaminate it and you would get growth. Or he would even tip the liquid and it would pick up the stuff in the bin 
Now, what, what is it in the air that actually carries the microorganisms? It's the dust. And so it was another group of scientists that actually came after Louis that helped with, with really pinpointing that, right? That it is actually the dust in the air that creates where they can, um, where it comes from. And so around the same time, in two different places, Ferdinand Cohen and John Tyndall helped demonstrate it really is the dust that carries the microorganisms. And that if you could generate a dust-free room, which some places, depending on what they're working with, right, they have these really super clean rooms, right, uh, for electronics and medical stuff. Uh, you could leave stuff completely open and nothing's going to grow in that clean room. Now you have to have really good air filtration, right, for that system. It's usually a double door system to enter in and out, right, to get all the yucky stuff off and put clean stuff on when entering in. Lots of people didn't believe Louis, so like most scientists, right, they try to disprove him, and several tried to repeat his experiment. And I'll tell you why. To a certain extent, that some current scientists are a little cuckoo bananas in writing out their materials and methods, because <laughs> they don't want someone else coming back and um, trying to disprove what they think they've proved. Um, so he didn't really, I guess, write out a specific. Um, we have some indications on what he used as a food source. We believe it was um, yeast that he used in, to make the broth uh, as a food source. Other people used what's called hay influ inf infusions, right? So this is dry grass, right, and soaked in water, and then that broth <laughs> was used um, to do the experiment. But what happened is that there were heat resistant, we now call them, anyone know the heat resistant form of the bacteria that um, can be dormant for long periods of time. So botulism forms these, anthrax forms these, endospores, right? So they were probably getting endospores in there, and guess what? Boiling will not destroy them. Yeah, they're heat resistant, as the name says, right? So they recognize that there were some organisms, that's why what was happening where other people weren't getting the same results, because when they were boiling, they weren't actually creating sterile broths. And so they got growth. Right? Even with the swan neck flask, because they never achieved no <clears throat> life whatsoever, or no potential life. So endospores are tricky little bugs. Um, you can incinerate them, though. right? Um, so in the lab, we literally do that. We put them right into the flame, and we completely turn them into ash. Um, just like we incinerate medical waste and such as that, right? So that it's just the minerals, carbon, ash, and minerals, all the water is removed. The other thing that you can do that we do also in preparing our media and destroying the media after we've grown organisms is we use an autoclave. Under high pressure steam, right, so like a pressure cooker, it's enough to penetrate and disrupt the spore coat and destroy the DNA and destroy those endospores. Does that help to sterilize uh, medical? Yep. Mm -hmm. So like those little sterilizers. I mean, even um, even salons that, you know, use clippers and different things to um, do people's nails, they usually have little sterilizers. And that's what it is. It's just high pressure steam um, that is enough to kill all microorganisms, including some, including viruses. Viruses are, are disrupted enough in an autoclave that you can destroy them. So that's the most effective way of, of sterilizing. The problem is, is that can you heat everything? Like anybody remember back in the day there was thing, you didn't put your Tupperware in the dishwasher, right? <laughs> because it became melted ware. <laughs> instead of dishware. Um, so now they're, you know, they're making plastics out of much more highly heat resistant, so you can put them in things like a dishwasher that gets really hot. Um, and there are some plastics that you can even autoclave, 
Um, mostly we deal with glassware though um, and metal. Uh, but there are lots of things therefore that we can't sterilize with heat, right? So we have to use other methods. Filtration, like we filter air, we can filter liquids. Um, we can irradiate things, and not the type of irradiation you're thinking about, right? Not that it stays in the food. Um, X-ray, um, not X-rays, ultraviolet light, right? We'll talk about later and how it damages DNA and therefore can disrupt and kill cells, which is also why you don't want to overexpose yourself to it, right? So UV light, we all know nowadays UV light is damaging, right? But I bet you didn't know it was damaging your DNA among other things. Does that make sense to you guys? Do you see this progression how it's kind of important to kind of, and these aren't all the people, like these are the major steps <laughs> in this process of figuring out that spontaneous generation isn't true, right down to even microscopic organisms and dealing with the problem of endospores. So what about disease, right? We started out this lecture, this topic, you could say, with disease. <laughs> And your book even mentions it too, right? And there are still people alive in this world, right, that believe that God is punishing them or someone put an evil curse on them, right? Some witch cursed them and that's why they have this disease. Those of you guys going into allied health fields, you're going to run into this, right? How do you help your patient and not hurt their feelings, right? <laughs> That's, that's a special, you know, I think they probably need a whole class on that, right? On, you know, um, how, how to deal with um, these, these beliefs that are not scientifically proven. Okay, so there was a gentleman, of course, that helped with this problem. So, of course, especially before we had microscopes, right, and we could disprove spontaneous generation and got really hard to prove to people that, you know, you, you, you got exposed to some microscopic thing and that's why you're sick. So we actually had to es establish techniques, even special tools, right? Like the microscope, like the Petri dish. I did talk about Petri last time, right? Um, and um, the food itself even, and, and instruments to use to be able to um, do these studies. <laughs> So it wasn't until those types of things were developed, um, and then the second component, right? Because when we talk about illness, we can't just talk about the microbe. We actually have to talk about the person's immune system as well, right? Um, and so it's, it's twofold as far as disease goes. Sometimes two people can be exposed to the exact same bacteria. One gets sick and one doesn't. And it could be a matter of a difference in those two people's immune system, how their body responded to that invasion. So that helped lead to the study of, of course, immunology, my favorite topic. So that was Robert Koch. So of course, this series of steps that he followed is named after him. It's known as Koch's postulates. And he was able to establish the link between what we know as Bacillus anthraxis, that bacteria, and the disease we know as anthrax. He developed this criteria in a lab working under his teacher, Jacob Hanel. But of course, it's named after him and it's known as Koch's postulates. And this is still used even today in some cases, although nowadays we're more molecular, right? We're looking at DNA um, evidence more so than organismal evidence. And this, as I said, helped us make that link, okay? This organism causes this disease. And again, do you think we can do that for all diseases out there? No, right? There, it's it's, it's kind of complicated, right? But for some, it's it's pretty um, straightforward. So he helped, right, establish the causative link between a suspected organism and a disease using his postulates. So this is discussed a little bit further in in eighteen point four in your book, 
right, than it is in chapter one. And so, again, I like this picture a little bit better. And actually, I don't even have a schematic picture for his steps in, in your <coughs> book. So, I'm a picture girl. <laughs> I know, poor little dead mousies, though, huh? Okay, so if you have an organism, right, especially a dead organism, died of a particular disease, what they try to do was isolate out the causative agent, right? What organism, what virus, what bacteria uh, caused this? And so especially for bacteria, we're going to try to grow them in artificial culture. And again, that Petri dish and being able to have things and be able to grow them outside of a body and be able to isolate them from one another, right? Where we're working with a single species of bacteria. You know, and we're going to look at it microscopically. They're going to run a series of tests on it to help identify it if they don't already know what it is. This very first step, can we do this for all microorganisms? Can we grow it artificially in the lab and identify it? No. Mycobacteria leprae, which I did research in, cannot be grown in a Petri dish. It's an intracellular parasite. They can't even get it to grow in tissue culture. Um, too difficult. Grows too slow. It's really slow. Like uh, they grow it in the foot pads of nude mice. Nude mice don't have an actively um, working thymus, and your thymus is where your T cells, part of your immune system, comes from, that it really will help defend. Most people genetically aren't susceptible to mycobacteria leprae. Their immune system can clear it, but then there's a small population, they believe about 12% of the population are susceptible to the infection. Is that, is that leprosy? Or is that... That's leprosy. Also referred to as Hansel's disease. So they grow it in armadillos as well, right? Um, armadillos are naturally infected. There's somebody that thinks that, that the, the lab caused the wild animals to be infected, but I really think it was in the, anim the armadillo population before people started using armadillos to harvest well, mycobacteria. They do, it's just they have a, a, a body temperature that's cooler than our own, and that bacteria actually prefers that. And um, so um, it grows well in them, but they are just like us. Some of them are susceptible and others are not. And they have the whole realm that we'll talk about later, how it manifests. We talk about immunology. It's a really good immunological example of, of how it can vary from person to person dramatically the disease. There's actually considered two types of leprosy. So one, you can't, what if you can't grow it in artificial culture, right? That, that creates a, a roadblock there, right, in helping in the study. And then what you're supposed to do for the postula is then inject a healthy individual with the organism and it should cause the exact same disease. <laughs> should, right? So, Again, mice. Can we use mice as a test subject for all diseases? No, right? And not to mention people get a little upset about the somewhat cute and fuzzy, I guess, mice are. <laughs> no, new mice is just because they don't have an active thymus, and it's one of the side effects, I guess, of not having an active thymus. You don't have any hair. They're not cute, and they're not fuzzy, by the way. <laughs> like those hairless cats. Ugh, I didn't work that much with them. <laughs> I worked with the armadillos. I took care of the armadillo colony and, and some some traditional mice mouse colonies when I did research. And, and then the typical microbiology culture stuff. So um, human immunodeficiency virus. Now we do know, some people know, we, we um, some monkeys are closer enough related to us that they do some HIV research on them. Right, but what if we get to something that's really truly human human only? Any of you guys signing up? I don't know that medical study. I don't think they're going to pay me enough money to purposely get injected with a with a infectious disease to see if it causes the infectious disease that we think it caused. Yeah, no. You found somebody that will <laughs> find somebody. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, ethically, you know. Um, you don't do those types of things anymore. 
right? There is some evidence of the past that certain populations, um, and we won't talk about that, um, were experimented on. Some of this very early scientists, um, it's amazing they had any friends, because they experimented on their friends. <laughs> if you take a history of biology class, it's very interesting. <laughs> um, so, and then they don't just stop there, right? So they give the healthy mouse the disease, right? And then they got to get the, the organism back out of the mouse, right? So it's a whole cycle, right, that we've got to be able to prove each step. And even he at the time, right, said that, you know, for certain things, we're not going to be able to do all of this. But he was definitely able to do all of that with anthrax, right? and prove that Bacillus anthraxis causes anthrax. And several other diseases of his time, right, was able to prove what was causing that particular disease. And so it was a very important, you know, um, milestone in um, microbiology and, and um, medical microbiology. So some of the techniques that I've kind of already mentioned, right, um, he needed auger. This is a solidifying agent that we use, uh, that we add food to. It is actually a polysaccharide from marine algae. Um, I actually think it was a woman that discovered this one. I should find out who. Um, and as to date, we haven't, surprisingly, have not found a microorganism that digests it, right? So it stays intact. <laughs> Unlike gelatin, which some of us use to make, you know, shrimp molds and jello and things like that, that's actually a protein um, that coagulates under cold temperatures, right? If you leave it out at room temperature, it does what? It melts. And not to mention, if you stuck it in a 37 degree, 98 degree incubator, it's definitely going to become liquid, right? And just like us, Lots of bacteria like to eat gelatin, right? So they would just turn it into goop, and we wouldn't have a solid surface. And the solid surface is beneficial when you're trying to separate organisms from one another, right? Having that solid surface to grow them on, whether you put it in a Petri dish or what we do a lot in the microbiology lab, is um, allow a test tube on a slanted surface to harden with the agar and the food in it, so we end up with a slanted surface inside the tube. Uh, tubes are, you can store a whole bunch more tubes in an incubator or refrigerator than you can petri dishes. And their lids don't come flying off all the time. Um, so the petri dish itself too is really important and this brings us back even to Louis's experiment that if you ever see a petri dish, right, you have the bottom where the food goes and then you have the lid. And the lid actually overlaps the bottom. There's a reason for that. It allows airflow, but airflow is indirect. It's indirect, right? It's not falling on it. It's moving indirectly. So hopefully contaminants are not getting in, right? But air can get in for those organisms that need it. Right? So very relatively simple design, right? But very important to its functionality. So Nutrient, when we say nutrient broth, when we say nutrient agar, right, this it contains nutrients, food. If it's a broth, it's just nutrients in water. If it's an agar, it's nutrients in agar, right? And so it will solidify. You can boil it to liquefy it, but it will stay solid at really high temperatures. You literally have to boil it to get it to liquefy to be able to pour it into, say, a Petri dish or a test tube. And again, depending on what organisms you're working with, you, you may use different types of media, right? Different types of food. Right? We call all the food we give media. Not to be confused with, you know, the media, <laughs> as in a news outlet. And then, of course, I said the techniques even for isolating. So we have the, we have the ability, right? We've got agar. We can put food in a Petri dish. But, you know, how can we separate them one from the other? And so that's one of the things that people are, who are in lab this week coming will start to learn how to do. Right. 
So we already knew with what contribution Van, uh, Van Leeuwenhoek Anthony gave us, or is it, what's linked to him. He was the first to do what? He looked at his own poop. <coughs> right, to accurately describe microorganisms, right? To observe and describe accurately microorganisms. Reedy, what should you think of now when I say reedy? Meat, right? Maggots come from what? Flies, eggs, right? Not from rotten meat. All right, so he helped us through that. Pastor, we learned about the swan neck flask. And when I say pastor, you guys think of another word, don't you? Pasteurization. And he is the one who developed it. It is named after him, pasteurization, right? Um, and he mainly worked with that originally um, to help preserve wine, right? So once the organisms that did the process of turning it into wine, right, whatever sugar, grapes, or whatever they used to make the wine, strawberries here, <laughs> looking forward to strawberry wine, okay? Um, some other microorganisms could sometimes get in there after that process, contaminate it basically, and turn it into something you didn't want. And so by doing a quick heat after the process, they were able to a quick, quick heat and cool, and that's what pasteurization means, heat and then cool. They were able to kill off the spoil organisms, the organisms that would cause it to spoil. And then they adapted to other things like milk, right? Um, and even juices, right, that are kept on the shelves or pasteurized. And so some level of heat, there's lots of different protocols for pasteurization out there nowadays. Um, so, I mean, it could be the level that you can actually have milk on a shelf, right, and not in the refrigerator case. <laughs> Us as Americans grew up not ha not having that type of milk, right? And so for us, it does change the texture, it ta changes the taste, right? Because again, we're dealing with heat here. Um, so it is different. Europeans, on the other hand, grew up on it, right? They come here searching for it, <laughs> right? We go there searching for the milk we're used to and we don't get it, right? Um, so, yeah, it's just a, a difference in, in, in what we've had available and what we've accepted culturally, um, but it is possible. Uh, but again, once you open it, what do you need to do? Refrigerate it, right? And it has a certain shelf life. Um, so, Tyndall and Cohen, these guys helped us know what? Dust. Dust is definitely what's carrying the microorganisms, and what else? could be in your broth that if you boil it, it's still not going to be sterile. Endospores, right? And so there's actually a process called titillization that's named after Tyndall. And that's where if you don't have an autoclave, you could boil and then incubate your broth <coughs> and then boil it again and then incubate it. So remember, when you boil it, you're killing anything that's alive. When you incubate it, hopefully those endospores are germinating and becoming alive. So when then you boil it again, right, you kill all the ones that were alive. And then you do it one more time just to be sure, right? <laughs> so it's three times, it takes you three days, right, to sterilize something in that manner. But it can be done, right? Petalization can be done. Nobody does it anymore. Most people have access to an autoclave, right? So the rest of you guys are sitting back and going, boil water. New Orleans tells us to boil water. But you just told me that now it is not really sterile. Well, no, it's not. But it's usually safe enough. When they tell you to boil water, what they're worried got into it can be killed by boiling. Right? If it wasn't, then yeah, they really probably should tell you to do titillization. And I think everyone would just be buying water like we do anyways, <laughs> whatever they tell us. Of course, of all the times, y'all, that that's happened, there's never been any contamination that they've told us anyways. Um, so it's kind of good, because one time I didn't find out until after and I had already showered and brushed my teeth and all that good stuff. So. Coke, we just learned about his postulate, so we should think now, right, linking a disease to an organism. Thank you, Coke. No. Um, Lister. 
Sounds like something you might have in your bathroom. Listerine. Yeah, he didn't come up with Listerine. But it is named after him, right? It is an homage to Lister, right? And um, so actually, I think I have a slide for Lister. Oh, Pastor didn't, you know, he he's, like I said, his list is long. I'm going to come back to it in a minute. I already said one of them. So here's Lister. So although he didn't have direct evidence, right, uh, he had indirect evidence that microorganisms were the cause of disease. So he developed a system. He was a surgeon or doctor designed to prevent microorganisms from entering wounds as well as methods for treating instruments and surgical dressings. So his patients had fewer post-operative infections, right? He realized that, hey, you know, cutting people open with this dirty shit is probably going to make them sick, and we need to be clean about it, right? And so we're super clean about that nowadays, right? And I always say anyone that does surgery electively is crazy, right? Because you're just opening yourself up to the potential of problems, right? If you don't have to do it, don't do it, right? Elective surgery is just that, elective. Now, you know, when you have to have emergency gallbladder surgery, that's a whole nother ball of wax. Okay, so back to Pasteur. So he's worked with a bunch of other people. And this is a really interesting one because this actually led to the development of vaccination. And that was that he found that over long periods of time when you cultivated organisms in artificial <laughs> culture, they kind of lost some of their abilities. And so I said, well, duh, they become fat and lazy. If you do everything for them, they're going to become couch potatoes, right? And if they don't have to fight for their food, of course, they're not going to, right? And think about that. When they're pathogenic, they're fighting against your immune system, against you, to eat you. They have certain abilities, right, that allow them to do that. Some of them produce toxins. Of course, we really don't like those guys, right? That's why we don't like Clostridium tetani. It's the toxin that it produces that will kill you, right? Same thing with botulism, right? A lot of the really bad ones produce toxins that literally will eat you. Right? So the, the flesh-eating bacteria out there, they literally are eating you. You are food. You are a big, fat, juicy cheeseburger to a pathogenic bacteria. You're food. Right? And sometimes you're a challenging food, right? And sometimes they've got to fight. So they produce protective layers like capsules that we'll talk about to try and help protect themselves. But, you know, when they get fat and lazy in that Petri dish, they stop like, well, I don't need the capsule anymore. Right? And so why put energy into making a, a, an extra coat if I don't need it? So he used that to his advantage. He found that, you know, they, they became weak. And so you could, you could do what's referred to as attenuation, making them weak by growing them in artificial culture, generation after generation, and then actually put them into a person and they wouldn't cause infection. Where before, <coughs> right, before you did that process, Forget about it. They kill the person. Nowadays, we have much more sophisticated vaccination methods even, right? Where we even just take pieces of bacteria and give it to you, right? They don't give, well, it was never alive to begin with, right? A virus. Never truly alive to begin with. <laughs> so therefore, you can never truly kill them, by the way, y'all. You just deactivate them. But, of course, most people understand live and dead, right? Don't try and explain to somebody who's not a scientist something other than that, right? Um, the virus they give you cannot turn into the flu, right? When you get your flu vaccine, you cannot get the flu from the flu vaccine, right? Everyone still with me? They don't give you a live one. Right? It's intact, but it, it can't, it's not exactly the same thing. Okay? So some people are like, but I got the flu shot and I still got the flu. This comes into when we talk about immunology, right? What they're doing is they're saying, here, this is what, like when you get the postcards in the mail that a bad person's moved into your neighborhood. I moved out of that neighborhood, by the way. Um, some bad person lives in your neighborhood you want to keep your kid away from, right? So you've got their picture, you know what they look like, you know their name. 
This is what we're doing when we're vaccinating. We're giving your body. This is what it looks like. Get ready in case it comes. And I mean really get ready. Get all your arsenal ready. Make your antibodies. Make your T cells. Make anything you need so that when this guy comes, you're going to fight. And you're going to fight hard. You got pre prior knowledge. That's what a vaccine is, is prior knowledge. So for the really bad guys, right, you might find out that they're bad too late, right? So if you don't get vaccinated, you get, say, the flu, you have no protection. Your body has no idea what the hell this damn thing is. It overwhelms your body before the immune system can kick on gear because it had no prior knowledge. None. Couldn't help you. Right? And that's why vaccines over the years have saved people, except we've run into this problem where <clears throat> there's been complications that have happened. There's been beliefs that have been disproved at this point. Autism is not caused by vaccination. I'm not even going to argue with you. If you still believe it, please do your research on reputable sources of information. Go to the library. <laughs> Right? So vaccines, right? He helped develop ones against chicken cholera, against anthrax, even against rabies, right? Using some of these techniques. And we have highly sophisticated techniques now for vaccines, um, which has completely changed the world we live in, right? I mean, we've pretty much got rid of smallpox worldwide for the most part, right? Except some little pocket hidden somewhere potentially. But it's not the scourge of the earth that it used to be. And vaccination is what made that possible. So I already talked about his alcohol love, right? So as I said, he actually came up with it for preserving wine for storage, but then it was used um, for other things. And so that's it for this lecture. We still got a little bit of time left.